I want to just wrap up this series of, of lectures with a discussion of the change in the class structure. So as these lectures are largely about class warfare and the ins and outs, the back and forth of the class warfare that I, I explained at the end of the, the previous video. Um, and now I want to look at what changed in the class structure. Let's look at the change. So in the 15th century, you know, and, and even going back farther than this, but uh, the details here under commoners are specific more to the 15th century, to the 1400s. Uh, but the classic class structure uh, in England was these three levels. So you have the monarch, nobility, including bishops uh, who had some claim to nobility, and then everybody else. Okay, so you had the monarch who was in the line of succession as a noble. You had all the other nobles who are not part of the line of succession or not, you know, uh, uh, swayed by that. And then, uh, and then you have everybody else, everybody. And so there's just, uh, and, and, you know, and often the monarch was just thought of a single person. You have a single person at the top, you have the nobles uh, there, and then you have the vast majority of people uh, under that. So highly imbalanced, asymmetrical class structure. Now, at the, at the end of this whole story, at the beginning of the 18th century, so as we move into the 1700s, uh, we have uh, still a three-tiered uh, main structure. So these three tiers make sense. We have, now, however, we have the capitalists at the top. And I think it's fair to call them uh, capitalists because as I sort of dissected in the earlier videos in this series is that from the time of Henry the seventh onward, um, the whole notion of wealth as land uh, is severely undermined even at the time of Henry VII, right after the Wars of the Roses. Um, and wealth becomes, begins to be conceived more and more in terms of money uh, as uh, some sort of evaluation in terms of money. And so you have capitalists up at the top, those with a lot of liquidity, um, so large liquidity means that if you have to gather together a bunch of money, uh, all of a sudden, you can do it. The middle class has a moderate liquidity, which means if they need to gather a big amount of money, maybe they can do it, maybe they can't. Uh, and then the commoners are those who just really can't do it. They don't have any extra and that's the vast majority of people. And, and in American society today, in 2021, um, a survey was done last year, the year before. It's hard. I, my, my whole sense of time is off because of COVID. But um, but uh, I think it was in 2019. The survey was done asking people if you if you had an extra ex expense of four hundred dollars, let's say your car breaks down and it costs four hundred dollars to fix it, uh, would you have that money? Would you have that cash money available? And uh, uh, forty percent of people surveyed, which was systematically to represent the population of the United States. 
uh, said that they couldn't. And, and so that's a lack of liquidity. And, and that's, um, you know, the kind of, you know, situation, I, hopefully that, that makes sense. The same sort of thing um, applies here. And so uh, we have this class structure. Now, this is not the class structure that we live in. This is the class structure in England at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, you have these capitalists with large liquidity. Um, their wealth can be converted into money very quickly. It's not necessarily sitting around as money, uh, but they can get the money. Um, and the countryside is still dominant. So as a holdover from feudalism, country estates are still at the highest level because uh, that's where the nobles live and nobility still has currency uh, as we've seen in this history. Uh, the gentry uh, landlords, uh, now the landed gentry aren't as side blind as they used to be because if you have a country estate, whether you're nobility or not, you have a large, a lot of liquidity and you're also probably able to influence parliament. You have money, you can influence politics, you can be a politician yourself, um, you can call in favors to get a parliament to pass uh, certain acts um, to defend your interests. And these, uh, landed you know, landlords out in the country with large estates uh, could be making a lot of money year after year through rents. So these are rentier renters, uh, those who rent out property, landlords, uh, in the way that we think of landlords. Um, and some of them are becoming powerful agricultural capitalists where they're exploiting wage labor and extracting surplus value out of those laborers on the fields and, um, and converting that into ever more uh, wealth in the way that I described in my schematic introduction to Marxism. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, uh, but, but doing that in some kind of, hybrid of agricultural production on the feudal model and the, and the bourgeois model of factory production, okay. Uh, and the example of sheep is very similar to that, where you just have large tracts of land, you have sheep who are, you know, easy to manipulate as objects, you have very few employees, these employees can produce a lot of surplus value, and you can uh, manipulate supply and demand in order to gain, uh, earn a high price uh, for your goods. That's going on, and that's kind of a holdover from feudalism, but we have in the city, we have uh, we have bankers who of course have a lot of liquidity, and that's what makes them bankers. Um, and they're a big player in parliament, the city of London, as I've been referring to them as, and, um, and then there's rentiers in the city who are renting out apartments and other uh, business establishments, uh, you know, so landlords for commercial purposes, landlords of apartment buildings in the city, uh, this all is going on. Um, but the status of being a landed uh, gentry in the countryside is not is not as high. You know, the, these these city uh, capitalists actually might have much more wealth than the countryside capitalists, but um, uh, but there's still a status to the countryside uh, for these landed. Uh, gentry and nobles out in the countryside. 
Uh, and then there's a growing class sort of at the bottom of the capitalist class is this powerful uh, burger capitalists who are running a burger style production, like I described with the master craftsmen, but maybe beginning to have managers who are the master craftsmen, and maybe they have several shops, but the production still, especially from the perspective of the journeyman apprentice, it still operates the same way. You still have skilled labor and uh, maybe a capitalist who has a lot of money, a lot of liquidity, can rent a bunch of shops and have uh, a master craftsman in each shop and have lots of workers um, in each shop that they're paying journeyman apprentice wages to and bringing up apprentices. And they're just sort of running it at a larger scale, but it's still not bourgeois production. That's to come in the next century. So this is a, a, a big turning point where the class structure in England, especially, has been totally restructured from the feudal order so that now the monarch is not sitting at the top of the, the structure. You know, the monarch is, uh, is just the executive uh, of the government. Um, and maybe we might put them up there in some symbolic sort of fashion, but they're not, um, uh, they're not nearly as important uh, to the political economy as it used to be. Um, and, and I guess maybe I should put the monarch up here at the top. All right. Uh, uh, I'll correct that. So the monarch should be up at the top still. Okay, the monarch still has a great deal of respect and power. Uh, but the landed gentry have made them themselves second to the top. And they're really moving in on nobility. And the, the commoners from the city, if they're bankers, rentiers, powerful burger productionists, they're, they're right behind the landed gentry. And so uh, there's these new players getting up to the top. And now the middle class begins to shape up as like uh, Anglican clergy with claim to peerage. So these are like the bishops and the Anglican church. They don't have that much power. They still have a status as clergy. They still have this callback to feudalism, but that's it. They have a title, but they don't have any liquidity. Um, Remember that during the Commonwealth, a lot of church properties were sold off. So bishops now are not uh, landlords in the way that they used to be. Uh, we have nobles even falling into the middle class because they don't have a lot of liquidity and maybe their wealth is even shrinking. Uh, that they're not making good investments. They're just spending their wealth and not focusing on making more money out of some money. Uh, you know, in order to stay in that highest class now, you have to always be making more money out of whatever money you have. If you start spending your money, you start falling into the middle class. Okay, and so a lot of nobles at this time find themselves getting in debt and getting behind in payments and just falling further and further down. Um, and you know, calling on favors of, of, their, of their wealthier uh, relatives and things like that, but never you know, quite being able to recover. Uh, like the Anglican bishops, you know, there's still this status of being nobility, but uh, it doesn't really translate into real power. We have physicians and lawyers uh, in this category, if they are making more money out of whatever money they have. Uh, but that's, you know, a pretty good living, but it's a lot of work, right? And as we know, physicians and lawyers to this day, a lot of work. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, you can make more money out of some money, uh, but it requires a lot of personal effort. That's a lot of work. 
Um, these guys up at the top don't work. I mean, they're not. That maybe these burger capitalists are still kind of, you know, put in hard, hard hours. But the rest of these guys at the top are not really working. That's really what distinguishes being rich or not. If you have to work, then you're not rich. If you don't have to work, then you're rich. If you can make more money out of some money without doing anything, that's what it means to be rich in this context. And that's different from the way it was in feudalism. There's a, there's a distinct difference here. Um, and then you have others, you know, sp small speculators who haven't quite made it, but are, you know, trying to uh, speculate on markets and things like that. And then you have commoners, you know, this, this terminology still carries over uh, to commoners and we still have the House of Commons, um, but it's not as well defined as it used to be under the feudal order. Uh, but you have lower ranking Anglican clergy uh, who are probably at the top of this because now the Church of England does have a certain prestige, um, even though it's dwindling in power. Because there was that whole struggle, of course, in the time of the Restoration to really make the Church of England a, a strong component of government. Uh, and then that battle was lost with the Glorious Revolution and the Act of Settlement and everything. Uh, out in the countryside, we have these yeoman landholders. Uh, as I talked about earlier, they're experimenting with small scale uh, capitalistic uh, agricultural production. It's not really truly capitalistic production because sometimes they're making money, sometimes they're not. They're not, you know, it's, it's, it's a hit and miss uh, experimentation and, 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 uh, the yeoman farmer here is putting in a lot of personal effort and living by the sweat of their brow. Uh, not a genuine capitalist, but seeing what's going on with the capitalists and trying to apply capitalistic methods in their own context as much as they can. Um, and, and this is sort of the the status uh, uh, of the of the entrepreneur, you know, who's like a small business person. Okay. We have uh, wage earning servants. Okay. Uh, wage earning peasants out in the fields. Unemployed peasant men or not employed, and then others, grandmas, women, babies. Okay, all that kind of stuff. Um, in the city, we have the master craftsmen now experiencing, uh, experimenting with small scale capitalistic burger production. Okay, so now this is the revolutionary class uh, for the coming century. Um, you have these entrepreneurs who are living in the city and they're seeing what the capitalist are doing combining shops and doing it on a grand scale. And they're thinking, okay, I can't buy up a bunch of shops. I can't do what the capitalist does because I don't have the capital to buy up multiple shops and to hire people and to uh, use predatory practices like flooding the market with, with cheap goods just because I can afford to take the loss. I have to make my money every week. Um, so what can I do? How can I beat that capitalist? Um, and, and, and these guys are thinking of beating, uh, the capitalist and, and they're part of the, you know, there are, they're part of the same social sphere, but they're at the bottom of that social sphere. And this is where these master craftsmen start to think about division of labor and take a skilled journeyman. And instead of spending all that time working on one person, what if I split up the production process into small discrete steps 
And then I teach somebody to just do that one discrete step. And I can do that in a very relatively short amount of time. And in fact, once you do that, uh, we're able to make more. Uh, there's something about the socialization of labor. This is what Marx calls the socialization of labor, which usually is described as the division of labor. But really it's where people are coordinating with one another in a labor process so that you actually get more value out of the labor that everybody's putting in. And that creates more surplus value. And then that means more can be appropriated by the master craftsman in this case, who then is starting to become a, a genuine bourgeois capitalist. And this is where we move into bourgeois uh, production. From this burger bourgeois master craftsman, but the, at the lower level who's struggling and experimenting and is being conscious of, of the ability to actually win this game. <clears throat> now, of course, it's very hard for, for this guy to win. Um, some of them do, most of them lose. Ultimately, you know, it's going to be bankers and rentiers that then see what these guys are doing and step in at the last minute and say, okay, I have the money to make this actually work. But you've tried and failed. I, saw, I see your experiments. Now I can benefit from that. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> but, but this is where this entrepreneurial spirit uh, comes from in capitalism is from, from this class of people down here. Uh, and of course we have wage earners. Okay. And our, our typical wage earner now we're thinking of this journeyman craftsman. Um, but as we move into the 18th century and we get the industrial revolution, skilled labor is not as important. We get de-skilled labor, the division of labor into small components that are easy to train and the use of automation. And little by little, the wage earner becomes what in Marxism we see as a wage slave because uh, the individual and their talent doesn't have much value. The only value they have is just the number of hours that they can put in. And you don't, we don't really need somebody that's that skilled. Uh, we just need a basic laborer. You will do, or the next guy, or the guy after that, and I can hire and fire you at will. You have no job stability. You don't have no um, sense of well-being. Uh, uh, it's very precarious, and uh, and you just have to keep coming back to work in order to survive. And I'm only going to pay you enough to survive. I'm not going to pay you more than what it takes for you to survive. As long as you keep coming back to work, I'm, I'm gonna pay you as little as possible. Um, and, um, and so this is now we're approaching the sort of labor conditions under which most of us uh, in the United States now work today. Okay, uh, so, so that's that. Um, so there's more to this story. There's still the Industrial Revolution, which will, which will modify this class structure. Um, so I want to I wanna do some lectures about that. And then we can really uh, talk about Marx and, and get a, a better understanding of what Marx was talking about, and then um, attack Dussel and see exactly what Dussel uh, is saying, which is very unique. You know, he has his own take on things. All right, so I will see you in the next series of videos.